so yeah, I'm um, very sorry I can't be there in person today. Um, my pregnant fiance is a uh, um, big, what's it called, P- uh, pelvic. Um, um, well, she she can barely walk uh, right now, so I have to stay home and help her. That's uh, why I unfortunately can't attend uh, the conference in, in person. Um, so yeah, I'm the CEO and founder of it for codes uh, which uh, provides cloud MQP, uh, one of the biggest WebMQ uh, hosting services in the world. Um, and we have, uh, yeah, and I'm also maintainer of a couple of client libraries uh, for a different couple of, uh, of languages so for Ruby, JavaScript, and Crystal. Um, we have used Bunny, the Ruby client, for a very long time. And it's obviously a very good and reliable client. But we started to having some uh, issues, weird timeouts, error messages, when especially the server were uh, being overloaded. Uh, I tried to dig down in the code and uh, fix uh, things and make things better. But I realized that maybe it's just easier to start from scratch. Um, and uh, so currently the, uh, the MQP uh, Ruby client I've written stands at, yeah, it's about at least half the size of the Bunny client and about four to three times faster or more resource efficient um, than Bunny is. Uh, but it also doesn't have exactly all the features that the Bunny has. Um, we also have a couple of uh, JavaScript uh, applications where we have traditionally used MQP lib. Uh, but also, that is a huge code base, uh, also very old. A lot of different maintainers over the years. Uh, has tons of runtime dependencies. It's a really big code base. Um, and one thing it was lacking was WebSocket support, which uh, I also implemented in this um, uh, client. And it's written in TypeScript, actually. So it transpires to JavaScript, but it has all the TypeScript definitions and all the uh, nice uh, syntax uh, helping uh, documentation there. Also, uh, quite a lot faster for publishing about the same consumer rate. Uh, and Crystal is uh, a pretty new uh, language. So there wasn't really any MQP client before this one that I wrote. Uh, it's a language that you can compare to Go, but it has a Ruby syntax, much nicer syntax, I think. Uh, it's built on LLVM, so it compiles to native code. So it's uh, very, very fast. Um, and as you see here, the publish rates, uh, you can't really publish 1.2 million messages to RevitMQ. Um, but we have written a, a, a MQP server in-house at uh, 84Codes or Cloud MQP called LavinMQ, uh, which actually can handle uh, this amount of traffic. Um, but this talk is about writing better uh, client libraries, uh, hopefully. So first, I will go through a little bit about the MQP uh, protocol, then how you can write the basic client architecture, and uh, and some things you have to think of, and 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 then some performance, and 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 summarize what we as a community of client library developers can do better. I think. So the MQP uh, protocol is pretty old protocol. Um, but they, um, it's a based on the TCP protocol. Uh, it's a binary protocol, unlike, for instance, uh, HTTP, which is um, more like text-based. Um, it means that uh, it's much faster and easier to parse and encode. Um, it's frame-based. So everything that's sent on the wire is uh, structured in frames with a, um, with a um, with a structure that I will go through. It's also multiplexed by channels. So each channel um, is, is um, 
uh, a concept uh, in the uh, protocol that uh, everything happens on a channel and the channels are independent from each other, but you can have multiple channels uh, on one socket or one MQP connection. The MQP protocol uh, 101, uh, which is like the uh, uh, natively or the most common protocol used for uh, when communicating with RabbitMQ is different from MQP 1. Uh, 1 dot zero, um, but it's no means like that. Uh, MQP one one dot zero is a better or like a evolvement of uh, one zero one. It's very different pro protocol, and in my sense, no much, no not much better. Um, so uh, MQP one zero one is pretty good protocol, and that's what we're still writing uh, clients for. Um, so when you're encoding and, and decoding um, uh, the MQP protocol, you deal with frames. And all the frames have the same format. They start the first byte or octet is the type of frame there is. Uh, there are only four types of frames. It's methods frames, which um, is um, um, things like QDeclare, um, it's, it's everything that happens, or you can do interact with the with the uh, with the server. Then the header uh, frames, which is sent just before the message body, and then there's the message body, and then there are heartbeat frames, which I will go over later. And each frame also includes the channel ID, which is encoded as a as a short uh, or a, a six uh, bit integer. Uh, we have the size of the rest of the frame, which is long or 32-bit integer. Uh, and then there's the payload of the frame, which is then different from depending what type of, is a method frame, header frame, etc. And then there's always the frame ending. The last byte is always 206 or CE in, in hex, which means uh, in this way for clients and servers to make sure, or one way to make sure that uh, the frame is encoded correctly. If the frame end doesn't end with this, is something wrong with the uh, with the encoding, and the connection will be terminated either by the client or with by the server if this happens. And so, if we look at methods frames, the payloads and method frames always starts with the class ID and the method ID. And so, there are tons of different methods in the MQP protocol, and it things like. Uh, channel open, channel close, exchange declare, queue delete, all these are methods grouped into classes. Um, connect, uh, all the classes have an ID, all the methods have an ID. And in the specification, you can read about uh, how the uh, arguments then are encoded as well. So for instance, for queue declare, you obviously have to append the uh, Q name and 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 uh, a couple of other things. Um, the header frame, which is sent before a message uh, is sent, uh, it looks like this. Where the first couple fields are more like legacy fields, uh, but the body size of obviously very important. That's the size of the whole body, uh, and then there's a bit packed property flags, which is just a short, and then uh, a list of properties. And the properties are the one familiar to you, content type, uh, delivery mode, headers, uh, timestamp, etc. And the body frames are very uh, are, are just a uh, opaque binary payload. Uh, they're just sent as they are on, on the wire. Um, but bodies can be split over multiple frames. So um, when the MQP connection is established, the client and the server negotiates a max frame size. And the reason why you want or might want a frame, max frame size is that if you were sending really large messages, you can uh, one channel could uh, starve out other channels. If you were publishing a very large message over a large uh, or a very slow connection. Uh, you could only um, send that message, but now uh, you can actually send a part of the message, then send uh, an acknowledgement or 
uh, uh, Q declare something on another uh, channel uh, and then continue sending the, the payload of the, of, the, um, of the message that you're sending. Uh, so it's a binary protocol. Integers are encoded uh, with big endian, uh, as most network protocols are. Uh, there are two types of strings, uh, but they're both prefixed with the length of the string. Um, it's very common with bit packing in this protocol, which also means that you're saving uh, quite a few uh, bits here and there. Um, most things are pretty easy. In, uh, straightforward to encode and decode, but headers and tables are a little bit more complex, um, uh, but uh, it's still doable. So example here in the JavaScript library or the TypeScript library here is uh, how to encode a queue perch. So if you want to perch a queue, uh, you send this frame. Uh, you start by uh, allocating uh, a buffer, um, here I've allocated to 512 bytes. I will never be able to be larger than that. And first, uh, the first bit is the type, and then comes the channel, the frame size, um, and then the class ID, which is Q, the method ID, uh, purge, uh, and then we encode the short the string, the Q name, um, and then uh, a bit, and then the frame end. And then we actually, in hindsight, update the frame. We go back and update the frame size uh, at a certain position in this frame, in this array buffer. And then we send it on the, on the wire. And the same thing can look in Ruby like this. Um, in the class channel, we have a method called QPurge, which takes the argument name, the name of the queue. Um, we generate the uh, byte array uh, for that frame. And we write it to the sockets, and then we expect a queue perch OK back. And if we look at uh, how frame bytes dot queue perch looks like, it's a little bit arcane or a little bit different syntax. It's I think it's inspired from from um, or taken from uh, Perl and how Perl does uh, binary uh, encoding. Um, but we put all the numbers and um, strings that we want to encode into the frame in a large array. And then we use a method called pack for packing this into a byte uh, array. Uh, whenever you're developing a, a client library of any sort, uh, Wireshark is definitely your friend. It uh, helps you see what's um, being sent on the TCP socket and it helps you uh, decode and, and uh, the, the frames and the data that's being sent on the wires very much helps you see when you have encoded or decoded something wrong, uh, what was actually supposed to send, et cetera. Uh, so the good and the bad with AMQP 101 protocol, uh, it's very compact on the wire uh, because it's a binary protocol. It supports very many use cases, uh, as you know, uh, everything from work queuing to pub sub and everything in between. It's very extendable. It's easy to add new classes and, and uh, methods, like something that RevDemQ has added is, is publish confirms, which isn't part of the original AMQP 101 uh, protocol. Uh, but it's also easy to add new functionality like uh, queue types. You can add arguments when you start a consumer. It's it's easy to add new functionality, but by just extending the existing mechanisms that are available in the protocol. But there are some downsides. Uh, for instance, it's a very verbose connection setup. It requires at least seven packages back and forth between the server and the client before you can actually send and do something useful with the connection. And that's terrible for clients that can't have long-lived connections. Uh, so for instance, PHP uh, is that kind of client where uh, the client, the connection only lives as long as the page is loaded or while it's being loaded. Uh, 
when you try to have uh, send a message, uh, start up a connection and send a message and then tear it down again, uh, is it involves a lot of packages back and forth, which means high latency. Uh, we have a remedy for that. We have developed the MQP proxy, which we recommend to all our PHP clients uh, or users. Uh, so it's a proxy that you deploy on the server and the PHP application connects to that local MQP proxy, which in turn have long lived connections to the real WebMQ server. Um, the MQP protocol doesn't have any form of batching and sending a single message requires at least three frames. Um, the way that the stream protocol or protocols like Kafka can sustain very high uh, throughput or uh, message rates is because they do uh, message batching. Uh, now, if you have very small message bodies, the overhead for each message is, is quite significant in the MQP 101 protocol. I also know cluster service steering. So if you have a mirror queue or a quorum queue, you connect to any server in the cluster and that server will forward your messages uh, to the leader of that queue. But it's more efficient if you could connect directly to that server, but in the protocol, there's no way of steering the client to reconnect to the correct server. Um, there are also no way to retrieve a topology. Like uh, you can declare things, you can delete things, but you can't list things. You can't see what queues are available on the server. You can't see which bindings are already on the queue, for instance. And there's actually quite a lot of bugs in the protocol specification, but the RevDemQ has a really good errata uh, documentation uh, that covers uh, most, if not all, the bugs um, in, in the protocol. Uh, so that's a good document to look at if you're implementing the, the protocol. Mm, okay, so client architectures. So typically when I develop uh, client libraries, I first map out a basic API that maps to the protocol. So in the object oriented uh, language, I would typically have classes like a connection, a keep connection, I would have a channel on the channel, I would have methods like uh, queue declare, uh, basic consume, uh, and all those. Uh, the maps uh, very nicely to, to the protocol, uh, but no fancy things like reconnect uh, logic and things like that, just the basics. And then I develop a high level API on top of that that does away with channels. So users normally don't have to think about channels. Uh, with automatic reconnect, with uh, thread safety and things like that. Um, the protocol uh, is both async, asynchronous, the server can send messages to you at any uh, time. And uh, it's, it's also synchronous when you're sending things like queue declare, you want the queue, de uh, queue declare okay back from the server. Um, so the way to implement that, uh, what I typically do is whenever the connection is established, I start a read loop, uh, a, a thread or code process or whatever concurrency algorithm you, you uh, method you have in the language that you're developing in to read, continuously read from the socket. And uh, when it reads from the socket, it parses the frames and it comes in and then through an internal queue forwards that to the channel uh, that the message is going to or um, which the RPC reply is going to. Uh, so in the Ruby client, the basic API looks like this. You basically just create the connection, you uh, open a channel on that channel, you can declare a queue et cetera, et cetera, uh, very basic. Um, but the high level API, you do away with channels and it does support, uh, uh, it does support uh, automatic reconnect for your consumers, for instance, and the publishes are uh, thread safe, 
and uh, queues up if the client is disconnected momentarily uh, and so on. So reconnect logic is uh, can be quite complicated in AMQP because AMQP is a stateful protocol, unlike say HTTP or uh, SQL or uh, things like that. So um, you um, the client libraries can uh, take different strategies. One is to do nothing and let it all to the customer. Um, at least you should guide the user then to how to set up or how to write uh, code that successfully reconnects uh, again. Um, uh, it's it, it, we see this a lot in the cloud and QP where customers uh, implement uh, a client library. Uh, it works great. Uh, uh, the publishing messages, the consumer messages works great until the server restarted for uh, uh, whatever reason is a plan up. It's a plan change or a, a version upgrade or, uh, or it just simply crashed uh, for whatever reason. And uh, the code starts to throw uh, all different sorts of errors and they have finally have to restart the whole client or the whole application just to get it going again. Um, so what you can do and what especially many of the RepMQ managed clients do is to try to store and replicate all the state in the client library. But it's not, it's not super trivial. It's very easy to get it wrong. So for instance, you have to remember uh, what was durable queues, what was temporary queues. You have to read the query list, temporary queues when you reconnect and you have to set up the bindings. What if the client uh, binded and then unbinded? And you, so you always have to replicate the whole state. And it can be quite tricky to get right. Um, what many clients doesn't do either is that they don't throw away all the prefetched messages that has come in uh, to the client before being disconnected. You have to throw them away because they can't be acknowledged anymore and the server will send them again. Um, same with published confirmations. You may have to make sure that you reject and clear all unconfirmed publishes so that they can be published again and don't stand and being uh, stand around uh, being uh, and, and you have to make sure to publish them again, obviously, because they haven't been confirmed. So you have to store them locally uh, before you can uh, remove them again. Um, one middle way here is to only allow durable queues. Uh, and uh, that way you don't have to remember or store all the state in the client library. Uh, Obviously you can, yeah, uh, so, uh, and then, so when you're reconnected, you know that all the queues are there uh, again. Um, and all the bindings and all that was in the state as when the server went down or the connection went down. Uh, so socket handling in the, in the client library, I typically uh, deal with is that open the TCP connection and do this uh, connection uh, establishment, the seven package dance. Uh, and then I start to read loop in the thread or fiber core process, whatever. Um, and I uh, let the read loop uh, read from the socket, the parses to frame and pass them to the channels. Um, typically I allow all the channels methods to write directly to the socket, but I have a lock on the socket around the socket. So only one thread can ever write to the socket at the same time. It's uh, otherwise you will get all these weird errors with um, uh, where frames are intermingled and the protocol, yeah, you don't follow the protocol and you will be disconnected. Heartbeats is a thing that we see a lot of clients get wrong. Uh, what I typically connect, uh, recommend is just disable heartbeats. In QP heartbeats, disable it. It is a mechanism to uh, make sure that the uh, connection, the TCP connection is still alive, even though it doesn't happen anything on it. So the client wants to be uh, notified if it's, the TCP connection is down, or because it can't 
differentiates between that and not getting any messages. So messages can come in at any time with any kind of interval. But uh, there's already such a mechanism implemented in the TCP stack. It's called TCP keep alive. And because that's implemented in the kernel or the TCP stack, uh, it, it is, um, uh, it's not as easy to get wrong or uh, it's not getting wrong, uh, but it does solve the same problem. So I really recommend disable heart, uh, on QP heartbeats because it's really easy to get it wrong and false positives uh, rely on TCP and keep alive instead. Um, it is easy to get false positives when either the client or the server are um, getting close to the resource limits. Uh, they're out of memory, 100% uh, CPU, uh, heartbeats can start uh, or not being responded in time. Um, and that can even um, escalate the problem. If the server is already overloaded, uh, a lot of clients think that, they, that the server is not alive. Uh, they are um, disconnecting because the TCP or the heartbeat timed out, they're reconnecting, using even more resources on the server, um, just uh, making the problem worse. If you're implementing, or well, you should implement heartbeats, but not enable it by default, then put it in a separate thread if possible, uh, or in the read loop with socket read uh, timeouts. Uh, so you set the socket read timeout to half the heartbeats uh, time, and then you send the heartbeats and then start reading from the um, socket again. It's, yeah, there are many queues before you get to the queue, as called John Nielsen says. Uh, in, when you're implementing a client library, there's a lot of buffers uh, before something actually is sent to uh, the server. So you obviously have the, the kernel has its own TCP socket buffer. Um, the standard library of your language most probably have a socket buffer as well. And you, in the, when you're developing the client library, probably will have a couple of different buffers or queues as well. And it's good to be aware of these uh, different queues and buffers and make sure that none of them are unbounded. It's, I've seen many clients that somewhere has an unbounded buffer or queue and the memory explodes eventually when something starts to back up. You can only get back pressure from either the server or the client if you have bounded queues. So an example is um, if um, a process uh, or the client library publishes a lot of messages and you have a, uh, but the server stops reading from the socket, then writing to the socket would block normally. But if the client is implemented in a way that the frames are put in an unbounded queue, that queue will just grow and grow and grow uh, and not get the back pressure from the server that he cannot receive new messages. Um, this is actually a bug right now in RevDemQ, in the MQP, in the RevDemQ shovel. Uh, it's being worked on. We have, I think we have a pull request uh, up uh, right now. Um, but it's common in many other client libraries too. Error handling is something that many clients get wrong too. Um, there are two ways typically that uh, MQP connection can fail. Uh, and it's even either if the server sends a channel close method or a connection close method. And these include frames includes a reason. And that reason should be exposed to the, to the user of the library whenever possible. Um, and the second sort of problems, of course, sec uh, socket errors. Uh, if the socket times out or uh, goes down, uh, uh, the client loses internet connection or whatever, network connection. Um, but I've too many, I feel like too many 
times seen that client libraries invent their own timeouts uh, and start timeouts for whatever reason, just because the server isn't responding quickly enough. But if the server is uh, um, uh, very busy and it can't respond to a queue declare, for instance, and the client library has invented its own timeouts and uh, that timeout's out, the server, the client want to reconnect again and da da da. It's just a very, it, it just escalates the problem even more because it puts even more pressure on the server. Or worse, even if that timeout was reached and the connection wasn't closed uh, and the channel wasn't closed, and then eventually that queue declare K came back, but then the client has already sent a queue declare again. And now frames are start or replies to RPC commands are starting to not fit with each other. You get really weird timeouts or weird errors. Um, so I would, I guess um, client developers have come up with these timeouts for whatever reason, but uh, I would be very, very reluctant to do that uh, and, and be very careful with your own timeouts. Um, so whenever you get the channel close or connection close, you should save that state in the client library. And whenever the user interacts with the library, you should raise that error as soon as possible and expose that error to the uh, user of the library so that they know why uh, a connection was closed, for instance, uh, or the channels were closed. So they do not retry again. We see this so many times that uh, server gets uh, overloaded because the client tries to command over and over again, for instance, Q declare with a new set of arguments that wasn't there before, then the channel will send a precondition fail um, back to the client, but the client is not exposed to the client. The client just retries and, and uh, it does that thousands of times per second and the CPU blows up on, on, on the server and uh, the server goes down and et cetera, et cetera. Raise the, uh, the error early and be as specific as possible. And make sure to clear when the connection, is, connection goes down, make sure to clear all incoming messages because they can't be act. And when they try to acknowledge the messages, they will get the precondition condition fail again, et cetera, et cetera. It's, um, and make sure to reject all outstanding confirms and RPC commands. Uh, went over this earlier. Okay, so how do you get any kind of performance when you implement the client library? Um, when you write a frame, allocate a buffer once uh, with a specific size. And if you try to allocate a too small buffer and you write to this buffer, um, reallocations with, uh, will happen. And that's slow in, in, in most uh, languages. It will be a heap allocation and it will, you will copy all the memory to a new larger um, section of the memory and it's getting really slow. Write the whole frame to this buffer that you um, initialized and then write that buffer to the socket. Copy that buffer to the socket. Reuse this buffer as possible, but beware of all threading issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and remember where we have to optimize. Typically you want to optimize for publishes and when consuming. Uh, it's no need to reuse buffers for, say, queue declare because you, your clients would normally not do this very often, not thousands of times per second or hundreds of thousands of times per second where this really gets stuck, it gets expensive. Syscalls are expensive and the client libraries will do two syscalls and it's writing the socket and reading from the socket. So try to do this as few times as possible. And on the read side, it means use as the large read buffer as possible. Read from the socket in large chunks uh, and then read from that buffer and parse multiple frames from that buffer. Uh, and same for, uh, for writing. Uh, so for instance, when you're publishing a, a message, you're generating at least three 
frames, merge all these frames, um, or, or rather write the all three frames into one buffer and copy the whole buffer with all three frames into the socket. That will save you uh, two syscalls. You only have to create one syscall instead of uh, multiple syscalls, uh, three syscalls for sending one message, which would be prohibitively expensive. And you can monitor how many syscalls you do with perf, for instance, if you're on Linux. A uh, very good tool for doing that. Oh, and something I see very lot, um, client libraries by default disable Nagel's algorithm. Uh, that's um, Nagel's algorithm is a performance algorithm that actually waits um, uh, for more data to come in uh, to the outgoing TCP socket uh, buffer before it writes a TCP packet. Um, so if you're sending a lot of small packages, uh, you will pay a lot of overhead uh, on the network. And if you were sending, say, one message that uh, will only a, a byte or a couple of bytes into a single TCP package, which over at least over the internet can be 150, uh, sorry, 1,500 bytes. Um, if you can pack multiple frames uh, or messages um, into a TCP package, you save a lot of uh, bandwidth and, and, and network performance. Uh, and because you're reading constantly, or most clients, uh, all clients I have implemented, constantly reads from the uh, socket, there's no problem uh, because some th people think that Nagel's algorithm increased the latency, but it doesn't if you read from the socket all the time. So what can we do better um, in, uh, when we're writing client libraries? Uh, we can write better high-level APIs that are simpler for the user to use. Don't have to think about thread safety, etc. They don't and reconnect logic. This is a big pain in many client libraries, and many of our users have to restart the whole applications as soon as the server goes down. Um, performance, as we talked a little bit about, many uh, clients can be much faster than they are. Uh, I think many of the client libraries that I've looked at have way too many dependencies that are not needed. And with today's environment with supply chain attacks, uh, I think fewer dependencies than this, the better. And better error messages. Uh, too many client libraries don't respond just with the most basic uh, reason why the connection was closed. And uh, the, the, the user of the client is dumbfound and have to use something like Wireshark to actually see what, what was actually closing the connection. What was the reason why this channel was closed or this connection was closed? Yeah, and that's uh, the summary for uh, for for this talk. Mm, questions? Oh. Hi, Carl. Thanks for the talk. Um, you've got a lot of libraries that you uh, manage to contribute to. Do you have any common integration tests or, or something that can test for like compliance for these corner cases? I don't. I wish there was such a thing. Uh, and especially we would need something like that emulates a, a, a stack server or an overloaded server that stops responding in different ways. Um, and and uh, uh, there, there's definitely work that can be done there to create the, even better client libraries. Definitely, uh, some kind of framework or compliance test uh, that um, uh, clients of independent or different languages can be tested against. That would be amazing for for the community or for the for yeah for the MQP uh, uh, client library um, environment. Thank you.